my pleasure to introduce Mingu Sok, who is our Excel candidate for this year. Uh, Mingu is from the University of Michigan. He graduated from Dennis Sylvester and David Blau's group. He's an expert in low power circuits and systems, biomedical engineering and energy conversion. He got his PhD end of last year, beginning of this year, yes. and he's now with Texas Instruments in Dallas. Thank you. Thank you. It is my pleasure and honor to be here at the University of Washington uh, to present my PhD work. And um, before I start, I'd like to appreciate the kind invitation from the faculty members, and also I'd like to appreciate many support from uh, Professor Scott Howe and Carl Ebling. Okay, uh, in this presentation, um, I'll discuss three uh, projects from my dissertation where we improve the energy efficiency of the circuit and system design substantially. And this large improvement contributes to the development of the millimeter scale medical devices. Okay, uh, let me start with the big pictures. Uh, we're heading to the ubiquitous computing era. Um, since the advent of the mainframe computers, computer volumes has been decreased 100 times in every decade. We went through the uh, mini computers, workstations, personal computers, laptops, and now we have a smartphone which can be stored inside of your pocket. The next, um, the natural extension of this trend is the ubiquitous computer. And I believe in the future, hundreds of computers are used by a single person, and this huge amount of the ubiquitous computing resources will contribute to the um, variety of fields in the human society. So as a building blocks for this ubiquitous computing era, um, there has been growing interest uh, in millimeter scale devices. These tiny devices can be embedded virtually anywhere and perform monitoring and actuation tasks. And the application of these millimeter scale devices can include uh, implantable medical devices, environment and infrastructure monitoring systems, wireless sensor networks, RFID tags, and so on. Our work mostly focuses on the medical applications, but many of the work can be easily extended to other domains and other applications as well. Let me focus more on the uh, healthcare applications and see how these millimeter scale devices can improve the today's healthcare. Um, in today's healthcare, when patients find symptoms, they go through the three major steps, which are test, diagnosis, and treatment. And these three steps usually happen in doctor's office and because of that, it's associated with a long turnaround time. And also it happens in uh, discrete manners, which limit the observability on patient and treatment progress. Also, uh, the today's health care uh, is dependent on the uh, patient compliance. So when patients don't follow the doctor's direction precisely, uh, the health care becomes less effective. So it's an important challenge to mitigate these problems and provide better health care. In this situation, medical devices, which has a millimeter scale form factors and multiple year of lifetime, can provide a significant amount of benefit to the traditional health care. These tiny devices can be embedded inside of the human body without invasive surgery and monitors uh, vital signs without being replaced for multiple years. The slide shows the one example microsystems, uh, which can be Im implanted inside of the human eye to monitor the eye pressures uh, for the glaucoma disease. These millimeter scale medical devices enable fine grain uh, test and diagnosis, which provide a uh, unique opportunity for the early detection of the critical disease and continuous monitoring of the treatment progress. It can also reduce the time um, associated with the test and diagnosis. And finally, the new healthcare system becomes less dependent on the patient compliance. Therefore, Better health care can be provided uh, with the aid of these millimeter scale medical devices. Despite all this exciting benefit, it is actually a very challenging task to develop the system which has a years of lifetime and millimeter form factor. Um, this is because the existing circuit and system design techniques uh, fail to deliver the uh, sufficient energy efficiency uh, to satisfy such almost invisible form factors and uh, uh, such a long lifetime constraint simultaneously. Any insufficient energy efficiency of the system and circuit can lead to a system uh, which has a large power source in order, to pre in order to guarantee a certain amount of lifetime. So the uh, picture shows the battery size of the iPhone, and if we can improve the uh, energy efficiency of the phone system, we can actually reduce the battery size, which further enables uh, uh, miniaturization of the entire phone system. 
The same story can be applied to the millimeter scale devices, and energy efficient circuit and system design becomes very important to the, to the development of this type of the uh, new computers. Okay, um, let's be more quantitative. How much power is allowed for these uh, millimeter scale devices? This plot shows the um, power budget of the system on the y-axis and the desired lifetime at the uh, x-axis over the different kinds of power source. If your system is allowed to use relatively large power source, such as AA alkaline batteries or 20 millimeter lithium coin cell, your system budget can be milliwatt or hundreds of microwatt to have a year of lifetime. However, if you are uh, constrained to use much smaller power sources, uh, such as a millimeter scale uh, thin film battery, which is actually shown on the right top corner of the slide, uh, your system uh, needs to consume uh, less than nanowatt to have a life, uh, to have a year of lifetime. So, uh, it becomes a sub nanowatt power consumption becomes an important uh, and quantitative goal for the development of these millimeter scale devices. Despite this high demand on the energy efficiency, uh, it becomes increasingly difficult to gain the energy efficiency nowadays. Uh, for example, um, silicon process technology is supposed to improve the energy efficiency uh, in a cubing manner, but this plot shows the uh, supply voltage at the y-axis and the technology node at the uh, x-axis, uh, and it shows that the supply voltage scaling has been stagnated at around 90 nanometer technology. And because of this stagnation in supply voltage, uh, um, we can only see the linear improvement in energy efficiency. Then what are the remaining options for us to improve the energy efficiency by another order of magnitude? Ultra low voltage operation uh, can be one of the attractive methods to improve your energy efficiency of the circuit and systems. Uh, if you reduce your supply voltage of circuit and systems from nominal voltage to the intermediate lower voltage, you can first reduce the switch energy consumption quadratically, and also you can reduce the leakage energy consumption uh, super linearly. So there has been many, uh, uh, it, it has been suggested uh, to use the ultra low voltage of 0.3 to the 0.5 volt as the supply voltage of your design uh, in order to gain 10 to the 20x better energy efficiency of the systems. However, um, ultra low voltage operation by itself is not sufficient for the target nanowatt energy efficiency of the millimeter scale devices. Uh, for example, a microcontroller published in 2008 ISSCC still consumes microwatt range of the power at the supply voltage of 0.3 to the 0.5 volt. So uh, in order to meet the target energy efficiency of the nanowatt, we, have, we need some techniques to improve the energy efficiency by another three orders of magnitude beyond uh, simply operating circuit at ultra low voltage regimes. Also, the ultra low voltage regime, uh, ultra low voltage operation can cause two other challenges, two other major challenges. The first one is the performance degradation. Um, the left side of the plot shows the uh, transistor driving current at different supply voltage. And um, as you can see, as we scale down the supply voltage, the driving current is reducing exponentially. And actually between 0.3 to the 0.5 volt, the transistors operating it at the sub regimes. Therefore, it charge and discharge the capacitance mostly with leakage current, which degrade the performance significantly. Another challenge of the employing the ultra low voltage operation is large delay variability. Uh, the plot on the right side shows the number of dopant atoms in the channel area at different technology node. And as you can see, modern transistor has about 100 or less dopant atoms in the channel area. So uh, if, uh, if, if the dopant count changes by process, process variation, uh, the transistor has a different uh, transistor threshold voltage, uh, which amplify the delay variability exponentially uh, through the exponential relationship between uh, leakage current and the transistor threshold voltage. Here is our research approach. Um, in order to overcome the mentioned challenge and the developed uh, millimeter scale uh, medical devices, we propose a series of circuit and uh, system design methodologies uh, to improve the energy efficiency, performance, and variability. And many of these methodologies have been conceived by rethinking the traditional uh, design methodologies because uh, some of the traditional methodologies turns out to be largely suboptimal if it is used without uh, too much consideration in the ultra low voltage operation. And the effectiveness of these methodologies has been uh, verified with uh, many silicon demonstrations. 
So here is the outline of the talk. Um, I'll first discuss Phoenix processor. Um, in this project, we mainly focus on the digital subsystem, um, which include microcontrollers, RAM arrays, and SRAM arrays. And we propose several techniques to minimize the uh, power consumption uh, as much as possible. Then I'll discuss uh, voltage reference design, uh, which can be embedded, uh, which can be used as a key building blocks for the many analog and mixed signal building blocks, like uh, ADC, radio sensors, and power convergence circuitry. Um, then uh, uh, I'll discuss uh, ultra low power fast Fourier transform core, which also can, you, can be embedded in the, in the millimeter scale devices and take care of some of the computational intensive tasks. Finally, I'll conclude the talk with the future research direction. Let me start with the Phoenix processor first. So these are the Phoenix processors that we developed. Um, Phoenix processor is a system platform which has a millimeter scale form factors and multiple years of lifetime. Uh, it evolves through the three generations, uh, but in this presentation, we'll focus on the first generation uh, of the Phoenix processor. And this is the uh, system overview uh, of the Phoenix processor. Phoenix processor consists of a CPU, a data memory, which is SRAM array, uh, instruction memory, which is again a SRAM array, ROM array, clock generators, I.O. circuitry, power management unit, uh, timers, and temperature sensors. And typical operation would be a periodic temperature measurement where the entire system wakes up based on the interrupt signal from the timer. And once the system is in active mode, the CPU pulls the temperature data from the temperature sensors and uh, process it, compress it, and store it in the, in the data memory. After this quick active mode, the entire system goes back to the standby mode again uh, and waiting for another interrupt signal from the timer. In this typical uh, low duty cycle operation, such as 10 minutes standby mode and 10 to the, 10 to the 100 millisecond of the active mode, uh, we can make an important observation, which is that uh, standby power dominate the total energy consumptions due to their long time. However, the importance of the standby power has been overlooked by uh, previous designs, so we propose a circuit and system design methodologies to minimize the standby power such that we can reduce the average power consumption of the system. We first consider the power gating switches uh, to shut up, uh, to eliminate the, some of the standby power consumed by the non-retentive blocks. Non-retentive block means the block that doesn't need to retain its contents during the standby mode. And these blocks in Phoenix processor include uh, CPU, ROM array, clock generators, I.O. circuitry, and interface circuit to the timer and temperature sensor. Conventionally, uh, the power gating switch is sized at about 10% of the total NPET width of the design to prevent any performance degradation. So the virtual ground uh, is close to be maintained to be ground such that the design can experience the uh, poor supply voltage rail, which is 0.35 volt, uh, which is 350 millivolt in this case. However, these large power gating switches incurs more standby power consumption because even, even if the transistor is off, there's a leakage current flowing in it. Um, since our primary goal is to minimize the standby power consumption, we try to use much smaller power gating switches, which is a single 0.66 micrometer wide transistor. This tiny power gating switch width is account for only 0.1% of the total NPET width used in the design. And this uh, tiny power gating switches reduces the standby power consumption by 1,000 times compared to the uh, conventional methodology. However, uh, relatively the large on resistance of these power gating switches can develop the voltage drop. Uh, in this case, we have a 150 millivolt oops, voltage drop between virtual ground and ground, which limit the supply voltage of the design to be 0.2 volt, which is 100, 150 millivolt lower than the conventional case. So we raise the supply voltage to 0.35 volt, uh, 0.5 volt, such that the design can experience the same supply voltage. This increase in uh, supply voltage uh, penalizes the active energy consumption, but uh, this is okay because the large savings in standby power uh, easily outweigh the penalties from the active energy consumption in this optimization. Um, so um, these schemes enables us to to make the standby power consumption of the uh, non-retentive block to, to be the six-peak watt uh, for the entire Phoenix processors. 
This work has been published in 2007 DAC and also published in 2011 uh, TBSI. Okay, uh, after this optimization, uh, we found that the SRAM consumes 99.9% .9 of the total standby power because this SRAM needs to be turned on in order to retain its contents during the standby mode. So uh, we redesigned the SRAM arrays from the scratch uh, for minimizing the standby power consumptions. Uh, we first proposed a new low power bit cell which consumes only 7.1 femtowatt per bit uh, using several techniques. And also we employ dynamic power gating switches uh, to shut off the, some of the bit cells that doesn't need to retain its contents during the standby mode. And the resulting two kilobit SRAM arrays consumes only 12 to the 20 picowatt uh, while retaining its contents during the standby mode. So we did uh, several other researches, uh, including the systematic process technology selections and also robust ultra low voltage ROM design, which has been published in 2008 ISLPD and 2008 CICC. But uh, for the sake of the time, we'll skip these topics. And uh, finally, we fabricated uh, this entire system um, uh, in 0.18 micrometer CMOS technology. And the entire system takes uh, one square millimeter silicon area and consumes only 30 picowatt uh, during the standby mode and 300 nanowatt uh, during the active mode. And the typical duty cycle of 10 to the minus four to the 10 to the minus five, the system average power consumption is reduced to uh, 30 to the 60 picowatt. And this extremely low power energy consumption, uh, low power consumption uh, confirms the viability to develop the millimeter scale devices, which has a multiple year of lifetime based on the uh, millimeter scale power sources. This work has been published in 2008 uh, Virasai Symposium and also won 2009 ISSCC DAC Design Contest and also invited in 2009 JSSC. Well, so it seems like at a certain point, if your duty cycle becomes greater, that you're using it more often, this technique is not going to be the right one and you want to use some of the other techniques. Uh, What's the trade-off point? At what point? But the duty cycle, is this the wrong answer? Okay, uh, that's, that's a really good point. Um, so yeah, many of the optimization results that the system has uh, relatively low duty cycles. And given the number that we have, like uh, uh, hundreds of nanowatt uh, for the active mode and uh, tens of picowatt in the uh, standby mode, uh, we have a break even point, which is the, the standby power becomes same to the um, active mode, becomes about um, 10 to the minus, um, 10 to the minus some, I, I can, um, so it's nano, hundreds of nanowatt, 10 to the minus seven divided by 10 to the minus 11, so it's 10 to the minus four. So below 10 to the three, 10 to the minus three or 10 to the minus four duty cycles, uh, the, the, the active power is gonna be dominated. Uh, but it also depends on the number of the cycles that you uh, consider for the active mode and so on. So uh, in terms of the number of the cycle we consider in the active mode, uh, is the thousand instructions here because the circuit operating like uh, 100 kilohertz. So, you know, you can do uh, those kind of optimization. And also you can um, uh, change the supply voltage as well to do the optimization here and there, yep. So, okay, uh, let me switch, let me talk, start to talk about the uh, true transistor voltage reference project. Again, uh, this voltage reference can be embedded uh, in many analog and mixed signal building blocks. Uh, to be self-contained functionality. Um, okay, um, before we start our design, we survey the uh, previously published low power voltage reference in terms of the power consumption at the uh, y-axis and the supply, functional supply voltage on the x-axis. And we also uh, survey the uh, power consumptions and prepared supply voltage of the digital subsystem for the millimeter scale devices like Phoenix processors and that is plotted as the uh, blue dashed line. And as you can see, uh, most of the lead dot which represent the voltage reference actually consumes more powers and requires higher supply voltage than the entire uh, uh, millimeter scale digital subsystem. Uh, this is because these voltage references uh, uses the uh, devices that is uh, operating in saturation regimes which require uh, higher power consumptions for the bias current and also requires higher supply voltage for the uh, headroom. So in this project, we try to build the voltage reference only using the transistors 
uh, that is biased in the weak inversion or substructural regimes. So we first start with a very simple diode connected stack. Um, the output voltage of this uh, voltage, I mean this circuit, is actually uh, temperature insensitive because it is uh, acting as the register divider. However, uh, the output voltage is also changing with the supply voltage linearly. So this is not a good voltage reference design because uh, the output voltage needs to be the same against the change of the supply voltage and temperature variation. So uh, we make a little bit of modification. Um, so we bias the top transistors using the register divider. So now the supply voltage sensitivity becomes, uh, uh, is reduced by uh, one over x times. However, uh, it is still has a linear relationship between uh, supply voltage and output voltage. And also this design needs a high value of register to be low power, uh, which is not a, a good uh, CMOS friendly design because CMOS technology is not, uh, it's hard to generate the large value of the registers. Um, so uh, this is what we uh, finally did. Uh, we biased the top transistor to the ground and also uh, use the uh, native or uh, lower threshold voltage transistor for the M1. And now the, become, uh, now the output voltage becomes supply voltage insensitive because the top transistors acting as the subthreshold cascode. Um, also this design has no registers in it, uh, which makes this design very compact in CMOS technology. So in order to understand uh, the mechanism of this voltage reference design, uh, we try to uh, deliver the output equations using the well-known subthreshold current equation. So after doing some math, uh, we end up with uh, some output equation, output, output terms, uh, which consists of uh, two terms. The first term is actually the uh, difference of the transistor threshold voltage of the transistor M1 and M2. It's linear to the temperature because the uh, for the first order because the uh, transistor threshold voltage is linear to the temperature. And also the second term is the linear to the temperature as well because, the, uh, because of the, the thermal voltage in the middle of the equation. So um, by sizing the transistor M1 and M2, um, which is shown here, we can actually uh, modulate the temperature coefficient of the second terms to be the same amplitude but the opposite polarity to the temperature coefficient of the first term. So which makes the output voltage to be the uh, temperature insensitive, roughly. And also this equation has no supply voltage terms in it for the first order, uh, which suggests that uh, the output voltage would be very uh, insensitive to the supply voltage variation. So um, we fabricated this voltage reference uh, in 0.13 micrometer CMOS technologies and also take the measurement and compare it to the previous lowest power consuming voltage reference, uh, which is published in 2007, uh, JSSC. Um, I would like to highlight that our voltage reference consumes uh, only 2.2 picowatt uh, at 0.5 volt, uh, uh, which is 16,000 times reductions compared to the uh, uh, previous state of the art, which consumes 36 nanowatt at 0.9 volt. And the functional supply voltage is also scaled from 0.9 volt to the 0.5 volt. Um, this voltage reference also improved the line sensitivity by about 10 times uh, and uh, uh, po uh, power supply rejection ratio by about 20 dB and uh, uh, design area by about uh, five times after normalizing to technology node. Um, the temperature coefficient is degraded from 10 ppm to the 20 ppm but uh, 20 ppm is still good numbers for many applications. Um, this design is adopted in many other designs, uh, including the DC-DC converters, relaxation timers, and second generation and third generation of the Phoenix processors, uh, which are all published in recent journals or conferences. And also is adopted in one of the uh, prototype uh, design for the uh, startup company. Uh, we also investigate the technology portability by implementing this design in three different technologies ranging from 0 0.18, 0 0.13 micrometer, and 65 nanometer technology. And we also investigate the impact of the process variation uh, and uh, propose a tree mobile versions to compensate the process impact. So this work has been published in 2009 CICC and won the AMD CICC award and also published it in 2010 ESS CERC. Well, how do you deal with process variation? Uh, so 
so process variation, basically, you know, the, when you look at the output equation, the, the threshold voltage variations affect your output voltage and temperature coefficient and so on and so forth. So what we did is um, we have uh, uh, multiple fingers on the top transistor and bottom transistors and selected uh, uh, die by die such that we can get the correct output voltages and correct temperature uh, coefficient. Um, does it make sense? Or? So you, you make this thing really small and then you make an array of them and you pick the one that... Uh, similar, but we have uh, multiple fingers for the... Uh, let's go back to the picture. So uh, here we have only one transistor for the M1, but we have uh, multiple transistors and switches on top of it such that we can shut it off some of the... So basically we tune the uh, transistor width of the M1 and M2 post silicon. Oh, I see. So if you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So basically, you're resetting this equation? Yeah, that's right. So I'm resetting the, this uh, ratio of the WL, W ratio, such that. And actually, there is a correlation between like a temperature coefficient and the output voltage. So once you, pick the, once you get to the good temperature coefficient, we'll get the very close value for the initial output voltage. So that's, uh, that's how we did. OK. Uh, let me uh, switch gear to the ultra low power FFT design. Um, in this project, uh, we try to minimize the energy consumption per FFT calculation. So don't be confused with any like standby power optimization that we did in the Phoenix processor project. We purely try to minimize the active energy consumption per calculation uh, in this project. OK, then how we can reduce the active energy consumption per calculation? Um, in the beginning of the presentation, we saw that the ultra low voltage operation can improve the energy efficiency by 10 to the 20 times during the calculation. However, um, there exists a limit of the improving energy efficiency in ultra low voltage regimes. Um, so this plot shows the energy consumption at uh, different supply voltage. And as you can see, uh, there exists a certain supply voltage. And uh, below this certain supply voltage, uh, which we called we opt or energy optimal point, uh, any reduction in supply voltage cannot reduce your uh, uh, computational energy consumption. Um, and actually, uh, extra scaling beyond this point incurs higher energy consumption during the active mode. And uh, this energy optimal point usually lies between uh, 0.3 to the 0.4 volt for many circuit and systems. And this, is, uh, this energy efficiency limit is caused by the uh, active leakage energy overhead. So on the right side of the plot uh, shows the uh, circuit delays at different supply voltage. And as we scale down the su supply voltage of the circuit, um, the, the delay, circuit delay increases exponentially. And this long delay increases active leakage energy consumption because mm, the gate basically leaking and contribute leakage, leakage energy uh, consumption for the longer period of the cycle time. And uh, this becomes significant enough to offset the ener switch energy savings from the voltage scaling. So when you look at this uh, left side curve again, the switch energy consumption reduces as we scale down the supply voltage. But the lead curve, which represents the leakage energy consumption, goes up rapidly and forming the reflective point in the energy consumption versus supply voltage curve. So um, there, people has been uh, designing and operating circuits at this energy efficiency limit. Um, however, there has been little effort to bring down this energy efficiency limit um, such that we can achieve better energy consumption per calculation. So, in this project, we try to uh, bring down this limit, uh, conventional limit of the energy efficiency to the lower regimes beyond simply operating circuit at ultra low voltage regimes. Um, in the beginning of the slide, I also introduced that the ultra low voltage operation can uh, degrade the performance and delay variability. So we also try to uh, improve these two uh, problems and propose a super pipelining techniques, architecture optimization, uh, latch-based design and clock network optimization in order to improve uh, uh, energy efficiency, performance, and variability beyond a simple ultra-low voltage operation. So um, let me start with the uh, conventional pipelining schemes and how we differently do the pipelining uh, in the circuit design. Conventionally, in ultra-low voltage regimes, 
long pipeline schemes has been favored, uh, such as more than 100 depot pool delays uh, per stage for the two clear benefits. First, this long pipeline schemes uh, reduces the sequential overhead, including the uh, register counts and the clock distribution overhead, which is good for lowering your power consumption. Um, it is also good for mitigating the delay variability uh, from the random process and environmental variation through the averaging effect over the many gate in the same stage. Uh, however, obviously, these long pipeline schemes degrade uh, performance and also increases the leakage energy consumption because um, most of the gate uh, just doing nothing and uh, I, uh, contribute to the leakage energy consumption during the active mode, while only a few gate uh, propagate signal in the same stage. Then what if we use a much denser pipelining? Uh, first, we'll get the uh, better performance, obviously. But more importantly, we can actually reduce the uh, leakage energy consumption during the active mode. Um, as you can see in the equation um, in the slide, twice more pipelining can reduce the leakage energy consumption during the active mode by roughly two times. Uh, because the cycle time is reduced and leakage energy consumption is uh, leakage power integra integration of the leakage power over the cycle time. And this reduction in leakage energy consumption enables further voltage scaling. In a few slides ago, uh, I mentioned that the, uh, um, the energy efficiency limit is caused by the active leakage energy consumptions. And now that we just reduced the uh, active leakage energy consumption, uh, we can actually uh, scale down the supply voltage further uh, while saving some power and energy. So by employing uh, denser pipelining, which we call super pipelining techniques, we can first reduce the sweet leakage energy consumption, which is denoted as the, represented as the dash it curve. And then we can reduce the switch energy consumption through the extra voltage scaling as well. And this enables uh, bringing down the conventional limit of the energy efficiency in ultra low voltage regime to the lower regime such that we can achieve better energy consumption per FFT calculation. Um, obviously, uh, there exists an optimal number of pipelining stages because the added sequential overhead eventually offset the energy savings from the super pipelining techniques. So we also investigated the optimal number of pipeline stages. And uh, it can degrade the variability as well uh, because the um, averaging effect becomes weaker as the logic path becomes shorter. So to compensate the impact from the process variation, uh, we, use the, we try to use the two-phase latches. So instead of, the, instead of using the flip-flop, edge trigger flip-flops, we use the transparency low and transparency high latches. And the well-known cycle borrowing ability of the latches uh, actually can remove uh, the hard boundaries between the stages and recover the averaging effect and the, uh, mitigate the variability. Therefore, uh, these super pipelining techniques, along with the latch based design, can be an attractive methodology for uh, pipelining schemes in ultra low voltage regimes. So, we employ these techniques in a custom 16 bit carry safe multiplier first. And uh, um, we uh, pipeline this multiplier in six stages. So, from input uh, of the multiplier to the output of the multiplier, we have a total. 12 banks of the latches. And the uh, stage depths uh, from um, one, uh, one transparency low latches and one transparency high latches, uh, we have a 17 F04 uh, uh, delays, uh, including the sequential overhead. And the logic depth between the latch pair is only 6.5 F, 6.5 F04 delays. And this pipeline depth is, uh, pipeline depth is more than 10 times shorter than the typical low voltage design, including Phoenix processor. Um, uh, we also perform uh, several circuit level sequential circuit optimization in order to facilitate the super pipelining techniques. And uh, we also perform uh, 2 million Monte Carlo iterations and corner simulations for uh, guarantee the functional yield in these low voltage regimes. So we fabricated these multipliers, uh, uh, which is six stage latch based multiplier. Um, uh, in 65 nanometer uh, CMOS technologies, along with the uh, one baseline multiplier, which is uh, one stage. And this plot shows the uh, energy consumption per cycle on the uh, y-axis and the maximum clock frequencies uh, on the x-axis at, at different supply voltage. Uh, 
operating point. And uh, as you can see, the proposed multiplier uh, reduces the energy optimal point from 275 millivolt to the 225 millivolt, which is account for about 20% reductions. And at their own energy optimal point, which is uh, 275 millivolt for the uh, one stage multiplier and 225 millivolt for the uh, six stage multiplier, uh, the proposed multiplier achieves 30% uh, better energy efficiency while operating at 1.6 times higher performance, higher clock frequencies. And at the same supply voltage, uh, which is uh, 275 millivolt, the proposed multiplier still consumes 80%, 18% less energy consumption while uh, operating at 3.7 times uh, higher clock frequencies. In order to investigate the impact of the process variation, we also uh, measure the performance of the multipliers uh, over 25 dies. And this plot shows the number of the dies on the y-axis and the uh, uh, maximum clock frequencies at which each multiplier can operate. So when you compare the uh, pre-plot-based multiplier uh, to the latch-based multiplier for the same stage, the latch-based multiplier uh, achieves uh, two times better average performance, average clock, uh, two times better average performance than the pre-plot-based multiplier, which confirms the effectiveness of the latch-based design to compensate the random process variation. We also did a bunch of other researches, including the clock network design optimizations, algorithm architecture co-optimization for FFT architectures, and a closed form equation for the energy optimal number of pipeline stages. But uh, we'll skip these topics and, uh, for the sake of the time. Uh, by the way, this work has been published in 2010 ISRPD, 2011 ICASSP, and 2011 DAC. So um, using all these techniques, uh, ranging from pipelining, clocking, architectures, clock distribution, and uh, other techniques, uh, we fabricated a 1024 point complex FFT core uh, in 65 nanometer CMOS technology. We measured the energy consumption per FFT on the Y axis and the maximum clock frequencies on the X axis at different supply voltage. Uh, uh, this is the design point that we simulated before we taped out. Um, and um, at the supply voltage of 0.27 volt, um, we believe uh, uh, this core achieves, uh, this core consumes only 17.7 nanojoules per FFT while operating at 2 point, uh, 240 megasamples per second. The clock frequency at this low voltage is 30 megahertz. And at the 0.5 volt, uh, the core consumes only uh, 30.5 nanojoules per FFT while operating at 1.4 gigasamples per second. The clock frequency here is 180 uh, megahertz. Okay, uh, so finally we compare our proposed design to the other low power uh, uh, FFT core design. As a key metric, we compare the energy consumption per FFT calculation and after normalizing to technology, number of the point, uh, bit width, and real versus complex calculation. Uh, we believe our core achieves at least 2.1x better energy efficiency compared to other design and also achieves more than 10 times uh, higher performance than other ultra low voltage designs. This work has been published in 2011 ISSCC and also embedded in 2011 JSSC. So what have we learned? Um, we investigated hardware design across circuit architecture and system layers for the millimeter scale energy constraint systems. And we also demonstrate that extremely energy efficient circuit and system designs are viable uh, in the building blocks ranging from uh, controllers, memories, uh, voltage reference circuits, and DSP uh, coprocessor, we achieve uh, many orders of magnitude improvement in the energy efficiency. And system perspectives, this confirm the viability to develop the millimeter scale devices, which has uh, multiple years of lifetime uh, based on the uh, same form factor uh, power sources. So what's the next? Uh, I would like to pursue on the research in the intersection of the hardware design and cyber-physical system in the future. Then what are the cyber-physical system? Um, cyber-physical system is defined as the system uh, which connect the uh, real world and computing systems. Um, and this combination of systems actually improve the adaptivity, autonomy, uh, efficiency, uh, functionality, 
and reliability of both uh, cyber uh, systems and uh, physical systems. Um, there exists a numerous application in the field of healthcare, infrastructures, uh, security, and resource management, and so on. And one personally exciting application would be uh, uh, develop a tiny computers with the image and voice recognitions. And these tiny computers can be uh, distributed in a wide range of the area and uh, monitors and identify criminals, for example, uh, based on their uh, voice and feature uh, face recognition abilities. Then, um, as a hardware designer, then what are the important criteria for developing the uh, hardware for this future uh, cyber physical system application? Along with the long lifetime and small form factors that has been important for the millimeter scale devices, uh, I can imagine some of the important criteria that this hardware should satisfy. Uh, for example, this hardware better have a more computational ability in order to perform more complex tasks and reduce the amount of the data to communicate, which is a big power uh, consuming uh, part of this type of the system. Uh, better security measure is also needed uh, in order to protect uh, more sensitive information, such as uh, healthcare information or national security information. Um, Real-time operation is also important uh, because uh, uh, in order to perform some of the timing critical uh, actuation. And finally, this hardware uh, needs to operate robustly uh, across extremely uh, changing environment, uh, such as temperatures or radiation level. So my future research goal would be the hardware design for the future cyber physical system application, which has to exhibit uh, low power, high performance, and reliable computings in order to satisfy all the important criteria that we mentioned in the previous slide. More specifically, I would imagine that the hardware operates at the clock frequency of the hundreds of megahertz and consuming nanowatt uh, in order to perform a very intelligent task in a dynamically changing environment for the extended battery lifetime. Then how are we gonna design this demanding hardware because it's almost impossible to design a hardware which can operate at hundreds of megahertz of the clock frequency and still consuming nanowatt with the technology that is currently available. So I almost believe this new hardware uh, needs need to employ some techniques to scale performance and uh, energy efficiency depending on the temporal requirement. Uh, for example, when there's not many things to do, the hardware stays at the extreme energy efficient point and saves some power. But whenever uh, uh, the new task comes in, the hardware scares its performance up and finish the task in a given deadline. This is how we humans are exactly made. Um, we humans cannot learn forever because learning consumes too much power. So we have to walk or crawl uh, uh, if you don't have to run uh, to save some power. And these saved energies can be used for the moment that you really have to learn. So in order to develop this uh, scalable design, uh, I would like to uh, leverage my experience on the extremely energy efficient design and also wanted to extend it with a variety of the scalability techniques. I'm also interested in the uh, vertical integration for the future research. Um, uh, during the PhD, I has been working on the circuit and architecture and system layers of the hardware design. And uh, uh, I still have the plan uh, to pursue this area in the future, but I'm also excited uh, in other domains, other layers as well. For example, um, um, there has been a lot of activities on the new technologies, including like uh, NEMS devices, organic transistors, uh, 3D integration, even 3D transistors that recently um, disclosed by the Intel. Uh, and designing uh, circuit and systems with this emerging technology is very exciting. And also I'm interested in architecture optimization with the uh, uh, design, uh, circuit and system designs. The algorithm could be a DSP or AI or communication, especially I'm interested in MAG uh, algorithms because uh, MAG actually hasn't been, uh, has, has not been uh, gaining a lot of attention, uh, but it actually consumes a lot of power and so on. Um, obviously the key to success to this vertical integration is the collaborations and because uh, nobody can does all these layers and all this optimization by himself. So, and that's exactly what happens during my PhD. Uh, for the uh, Phoenix processors, we uh, work with the eye surgeons and MEMS expert and battery expert at the WIMS ERC at the University of Michigan. 
And we also, um, um, for the FFT project, we also collaborated with the civil engineering expert and radar expert uh, because the FFT is part of the two big, bigger projects, one for uh, uh, bridge monitoring systems and the other for um, uh, flying surveillance robot systems. And also we collaborated with the DSP algorithm expert uh, for the architecture algorithm optimization uh, part of the FFT project. Okay, let's zoom out a little bit and look at the current landscape of the computings. Um, energy efficiency uh, is needed everywhere. Uh, in the data center, data center need a better energy efficiency to reduce the cost associated with the coolings and computations. Uh, laptops and smartphones looking for better energy efficiency to extend the battery lifetime and also reduce the volume of the uh, system. Our focus, we mostly focus on the low power techniques in the low end application like uh, millimeter scale devices. But uh, I'm also interested in looking for the trickle of impact uh, to the high-end application, including servers and uh, mobile platform. OK, uh, here's the summary of my talk. Um, we saw that there's a numerous application of, of the millimeter scale uh, devices. Cyber-physical system is one exciting application, but there can be many other applications that we haven't discovered yet. And energy efficiency has been the key uh, for the development of these millimeter scale devices. But uh, we just saw that the performance and reliability becomes increasingly important. Uh, in this situation, I would like to make a bold uh, claim. Um, gigahertz race is over. And I believe for the next 10 years, a competition for the nanowatt will be extremely important. I want to be part of this exciting challenge and push the frontier of the computer and information technology. Uh, thank you for your attention. That's all I have. We have time for a couple of questions. So I was just going to go back and ask you about the clocking of your electrical power systems uh -huh. and the issues that you fix there and how much power goes into the clocking itself, okay. especially for the FFT processor. I see, I see. So you are you talking about the clock distribution, right? So yeah, uh, when we decide the number of the optimal pipeline stages, we also include the uh, clock power. So the number actually reflect the clock overhead. But uh, uh, actually, clocking overhead becomes less actually in low voltage regimes because uh, clock is mostly uh, switch energy dominated, right? And as you scale down the supply voltage, actually leakage energy starts to dominate it, and you know clock becomes low, less portion, but it's still, I, I would expect still um, like 20% of the entire power consumption. I would have thought with your last base design there would have been a problem with races. Excuse me? There would have been a problem with races with your last Oh, races. Design. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's the one disadvantage is that we, we, better, we, we get a better, more uh, race conditions, right? So the thing is we use these latches only in the multiplier and multiplier is very uh, um, regular structures in terms of the topologies. So you, we can easily identify short passes, and you can just you know uh, adding buffers in the right places and learning the uh, Monte Carlo simulation to guarantee that it's not going to happen. I mean, it's not going the short pass is not going to happen uh, uh, from the process variation or something like that. Yeah, of course, sir. Uh, can you go back to your slide on, what was it, PGS optimization? Okay. Standby. Uh-huh. Yeah, this guy. Yep. So, the, if I understand it, the, the idea is to reduce the standby that's current right. that's, that's being drawn. Right. You're, you're basically making the, the switch, the power down switch, you're making it, it much uh, thinner. Right. Yeah, that's, more, that's why. Okay. Right. Um, so, by doing that, you're basically adding a resistor between the, the ground of the processor to, yeah. the, to the ground. Yeah, they, their resistance is higher than the conventional case. Okay, so then, but then, actually, the question I might have on that is, isn't a component of the leakage current from the, from the gate to the, to the bulk? Oh, uh, gate? I, I talking about the gate oxide? Yeah, don't you have a component uh, of uh, gate oxide leakage? And in this case, in which case, if I understand this correctly, mm -hmm. this guy is between the ground of the, the processor and, and the ground, so why not put the switch on the, on the other end with the supply? Because right now you still have all the gates. So are you saying that uh, adding another transistors here? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering why why the switch on on the bottom oh, oh, instead, instead of, of instead of uh, at the oh. 
at the VDD. I see, I see. Don't, so you you still, don't you still have the leakage current? Uh, uh, that's a good point. Uh, we also consider that. Uh, the thing is, um, first, the gate leakage is very low uh, in these particular technologies because it's 0.18 micrometer, micrometer CMOS. And also, the voltage range that we're working on is very low. So even the new technology, we don't have that many gate leakage, actually, because you know, uh, the, the, the electric field over the oxide is relatively low in this domain. So that's one, one thing. And we could put the uh, PMOS transistor on top instead of the NMOS. I mean, that's ob obviously a, 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 another option. But uh, we just put, choose the bottom part uh, because um, um, uh, first, uh, the, the subthreshold slope of this uh, bottom transistor is sharp. I mean, NPAD is sharper than the uh, PPAD in this technology, subthreshold slope. The, the, how, how much you can turn up the transistor. So that's actually sharper for the NPAD. So uh, it turns out to be NPAD is slightly better than the PMOS just for the technology. But obviously, you don't lose too much if you just put the PMOS on top. OK, and then when, when you're actually operating and the switch is on, so you've got this resistance, right. is it not fair to say that the ground is going, the ground of the, I guess, what you call the design in that, hmm. in that diagram, isn't that ground going to move around depending on the loading? Of the uh, that's, that's a good point. And, um, and also, the, to sort of a follow-on to that question is, how, where does process variation fit, right, particularly right. for the that's, size? That's the resistor is going to be moving around, right? Yeah, yeah. So the thing is, um, so this transistor is working in the subthreshold regimes, the power gain switches. So the, the, when you look at the subthreshold current equation, the BDS dependency is exponential. So the equation is like a, a proportional to the 1 minus uh, exponential uh, minus BDS or something like that. So once you hit the, some threshold of the BDS, uh, your current is not changing. I mean, your uh, BDS is not changing that much. You know what I'm saying? I, I think I lost you. But uh, well, so let me. Uh, okay. But is it not fair to say that it's it's basically a resistor, right? When you when you have it, uh, is it a resistor or is it not a resistor? It has the uh, resistance values in it, but you can turn it on and turn it off and change the resistor value. So is it, is that are you somehow modulating or monitoring that the the ground and the design and then modulating the gate somehow regulating? Mm -hmm. No, actually, the, the, the virtual ground is quite, sub, quite stable because, uh, because the, the leakage equation uh, basically has a very high sensitivity, a very low sensitivity of the BDS. So even though your load current is changing a lot, uh, your uh, BDS of these power gating switches from you know, ground to the virtual ground is not changing that much, actually. So we actually uh, simulated and look at the, um, so once you're hitting like some voltage, which is 150 millivolt around that range, uh, even if your load current is goes up, then your um, transistor uh, BDS is not changing that much. And also, it's, it's, you, can, you can consider it as a diode or something like that. So once you put the diode there, then the bias, bi diode drop voltage is almost the same, regardless of your, where you're operating in terms of the curve. So you can consider it as a, a good diode like BJT type of the diode because there's exponential relationship. It's because you have it in some threshold. Right, right. right. So then the obvious question is going to be, how do you guarantee that the device is staying in some threshold over process or temperature? That's um, the classic, uh, classic question. How can I? Well, um, so the gate voltage, we have a control on the gate voltage. So once you put the gate voltage below the sub -threshold, I mean, threshold voltage of the transistor, the transistor is always in subthreshold regimes. So this gate voltage, if you put it like a 0.3 volt or 0.4 volt or something like that, that's always below the subthreshold, I mean, in the subthreshold regimes. It seems clear that the on-off ratio of that transistor is important. Right. And you pay a huge price for that finite on-off ratio. Mm -hmm. So why not design a circuit that boosts, that bootstraps the gate voltage? Yeah, that's, that's, that's no energy to do that. That's, that's a good point. Yeah, actually we did uh, put the second generation and third generation. Obviously, there's some um, argument like, uh, oh, okay, if you use the you know, separate supply voltages, then how are going to uh, estimate their impact on the total energy consumption? Because you, you somewhat need the charge pumps and so on and so forth. But well, it turns out to be most of the system, the learning of the battery, which the output voltage is actually much higher, like 1.5 volts, 3 volts, something like that. And you can actually provide uh, two supply voltages without too much overhead. And you know, obviously, if you have that kind of options, you know, you could always bring up another supply voltages, uh, which make your design a little bit more complicated, but should be a better choice. Yeah, totally agree with that.
Yep. Great. Thank you. Thanks.